It had pressurized rubber tires 4 inches wide and 16 inches in diameter, containing nitrogen and inflated to about 1.5 pounds per square inch. The first use of tires on the moon, these were developed by Goodyear and were dubbed their XLT model. Two legs combined with the wheels to provide four-point stability when at rest. This followed a launch delay due to weather of 40 minutes and 2 seconds, the first such delay in the Apollo program. The original planned time, 3.23 p.m., was at the very start of the launch window of just under four hours, had Apollo 14 not launched during it, it could not have departed until March. Apollo 12 had launched during poor weather and twice been struck by lightning, as a result of which the rules had been tightened. Because it had, just over two days after launch, the mission timers would be put ahead by 40 minutes and 3 seconds so that later events would take place at the time scheduled in the flight plan. After the vehicle reached orbit, the SIVB third stage shut down, and the astronauts performed checks of the spacecraft before restarting the stage for translunar injection, the burn that placed the vehicle on course for the moon. The CSM separated from the SIVB, and RUSA performed the transposition maneuver, turning it around in order to dock with the LM before the entire spacecraft separated from the stage. RUSA, who had practiced the maneuver many times, hoped to break the record for the least amount of propellant used in docking. When he gently brought the modules together, the docking mechanism would not activate. He made several attempts over the next two hours, as mission controllers huddled and sent advice. If the LM could not be extracted from its place on the SIVB, no lunar landing could take place, and with consecutive failures, the Apollo program might end. Mission Control proposed that they try it again with the docking probe retracted, hoping the contact would trigger the latches. This worked, and within an hour the joined spacecraft had separated from the SIVB. The stage was set on a course to impact the moon, which it did just over three days later, causing the Apollo 12 seismometer to register vibrations for over three hours. At 60 to 30 ground elapsed time, Shepard and Mitchell entered the LM to check its systems, while there they photographed a wastewater dump from the CSM, part of a particle contamination study in preparation for Skylab. Two mid-course corrections were performed on the translunar coast, with one burn lasting 10.19 seconds and one lasting 0.65 seconds. 70 into the mission, the service propulsion system engine in the SM was fired for 370.84 seconds to send the craft into a lunar orbit with apocynthian of 169 nautical miles and paracynthian of 58.1 nautical miles. A second burn, at 86 hours 10 minutes and 52 seconds mission time, sent the spacecraft into an orbit of 58.8 nautical miles by 9.1 nautical miles. This was done in preparation for the release of the LM Antares. Apollo 14 was the first mission on which the CSM propelled the LM to the lower orbit though Apollo 13 would have done so had the abort not already occurred. This was done to increase the amount of hover time available to the astronauts, a safety factor since Apollo 14 was to land in rough terrain. After separating from the command module in lunar orbit, the LM Antares had two serious problems. First, the LM computer began getting an abort signal from a faulty switch. NASA believed the computer might be getting erroneous readings like this if a tiny ball of solder had shaken loose and was floating between the switch and the contact, closing the circuit. If the problem recurred after the descent engine fired, the computer would think the signal was real and would initiate an auto-abort, causing the ascent stage to separate from the descent stage and climb back into orbit. The fix made it appear to the system that an abort had already happened, and it would ignore incoming automated signals to abort. This would not prevent the astronauts from piloting the ship, though if an abort became necessary, they might have to initiate it manually. Mitchell entered the changes with minutes to go until planned ignition. A second problem occurred during the powered descent, when the LM landing radar failed to lock automatically onto the moon's surface, depriving the navigation computer of vital information on the vehicle's altitude and vertical descent speed. After the astronauts cycled the landing radar breaker, the unit successfully acquired a signal near 22,000 feet. Mission rules required an abort if the landing radar was out at 10,000 feet, though Shepard might have tried to land without it. With the landing radar, Shepard steered the LM to a landing which was the closest to the intended target of the six missions that landed on the moon. Shepard stated, after stepping onto the lunar surface, and it's been a long way, but we're here. The first EVA began at 9.42 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on February 5, 1971, having been delayed by a problem with the communication system which set back the start of the first EVA to five hours after landing. The astronauts devoted much of the first EVA to equipment offloading, deployment of the ALSCP and the U.S. flag, as well as setting up and loading the MET. These activities were televised back to Earth, 
though the picture tended to degenerate during the latter portion of the EVA. Mitchell deployed the ASE's geophone lines, unreeling and emplacing the two 310-feet lines leading out from the ALSEP's central station. He then fired the thumper explosives, vibrations from which would give scientists back on Earth information about the depth and composition of the lunar regolith. On the way back to the LM, the astronauts collected and documented lunar samples, and took photographs of the area. The first EVA lasted 4 hours, 47 minutes, 50 seconds. Some geologists were pleased enough with the close approach to Cone Crater to send a case of scotch to the astronauts while they were in post-mission quarantine, though their enthusiasm was tempered by the fact that Shepard and Mitchell had documented few of the samples they brought back, making it hard and sometimes impossible to discern where they came from. A total of 94 pounds of moon rocks, our lunar samples, were brought back from Apollo 14. Most are breccias, which are rocks composed of fragments of other, older rocks. There were a few basalts that were collected in this mission in the form of clasts in breccia. The Apollo 14 basalts are generally richer in aluminum and sometimes richer in potassium than other lunar basalts. Most lunar mare basalts collected during the Apollo program were formed from 3.0 to 3.8 billion years ago. The Apollo 14 basalts were formed 4.0 to 4.3 billion years ago, older than the volcanism known to have occurred at any of the mare locations reached during the Apollo program.